Well, great. Well, I'm here with Roger Crone. Um, Roger currently has the uh, the dean's seat, I like to call him, in the government contracting community, because I, I think Linus is the biggest pure play you know, services contractor uh, out there at this point, right? Over 10 billion. I wouldn't argue with uh, yeah. you, Yeah, yeah, so, uh, but, um, so, and Roger's an interesting career, I think in many ways reflects the changes in the industry. 40 years in the business, but an aerospace engineer, and I, I wanna come back to some career and leadership things too later. Um, General Dynamics, McDonnell Douglas, we met when you were running uh, Boeing's uh, a networking and space, space business, and then uh, the CEO of Lidos. Um, so it's, uh, uh, and he's also will become the uh, chairman of the Professional Services Council in January and uh, is an industry leader. And, and one, one of the things I like about Roger's career and, and Roger in general is um, having just you know, written a book about having an impact beyond your balance sheet as a, as a corporate leader is uh, he's on the boards of the Urban League and our public television station and a number of other different initiatives, which, which I hope we get a chance to get into. So uh, a community leader, not just um, a, a corporate leader, industry leader, community leader, and corporate leader. So, so it's great to have you here for the conversation and thanks for, thanks for taking the time. Let me, let me ask you first about just uh, a reflection on the journey of, of your company. If, if someone had told me you know, seven, eight years ago that an iconic company with a kind of iconic founder culture was going to be first split into two different companies and then one and then one of the remaining companies would then merge with a huge part of another aerospace company and it would create a the biggest pure play government contracting services provider that the industry's uh, ever known I would have said, well, that's silly. What's, what's going on? What, what I would have said is, what's going to happen in the environment that would prompt somebody to want to do that? But not only has it been done, SAIC split, uh, Lidos came into being, and then you pulled off one of the biggest mergers uh, in history in the services business with the integration of, of Lockheed's business, uh, services business there. So um, rather than the corporate strategy, which you had to say as a public company CEO many times, can you reflect with us, what was happening in the industry? What, what was happening in the way the government is buying things and the way technology and systems are being procured that might have provided a background or a rationale for that series of moves which were, were not so predictable only a couple of years ago? Yeah, well, I, I think there were maybe two ways to look at it. There was sort of this you know, environmental regulatory issue, and we may come back to it, right. but a lot of these, these type of developments flowed down from what we kind of refer to as the Druyan, uh, the Druyan issue. And then, um, so that really what, what led to actually quite a few of the companies in the industry that all have kind of these kind of you know, new kind of novel names. Um, and then the consolidation um, really is about scale and having an impact and having enough resources and balance sheet to invest and to grow. And it's, you know, it's a big business, it's a big challenge. Um, to differentiate yourself, it requires a strong balance sheet, great set of people, past performance. And we looked at it you know, in, you know, in 2014, 2015, and where we were and said, you, know, you become a little bit niche, even at, I mean, at, it's hard to believe, even at five billion, right? Because right. Right? if you do, say, industry 3% uh, of revenue and investment, that's 150 million. If you double the size of the company, you can double the size of the resources that you have to invest and grow. And, and we, as a leadership team, because really a decision with me and the board said, we're either gonna be acquire or, or an acquire E. And um, had obviously run numbers all different ways, and then it, we just, I'd like to say we're really smart, we're also very fortunate and very lucky that the right opportunity came up at the right time with the right structure, and so the reverse Morris Trust allowed us to use some equity and some debt to uh, close the transaction with Lockheed, and, um, and then I think what's maybe the amazing thing is that we integrated so well. Uh, and, and John, you know. Which nobody was predicting. I mean, this is, everybody said, this is chalk right. and cheese, right? right. This is not going to work. 
Well, and and you know the. I mean, I knew you couldn't say that publicly, but that's, I, we were all saying it. Um, right. Well, let's but see. It, but it's worked really well. It, it has worked uh, beyond anyone's expectations. Right. It has been fantastic. Um, yeah, and I, I've said this before. I was at McDonnell Douglas when we were bought by Boeing, right. and I think maybe from a leadership standpoint that helped because I I had a sense of what it was like, you know, to go through a, a transaction as the company that was bought. And I learned a lot personally about the good and the bad. And I think I was able to bring that to kind of the, our plan to bring the two organizations together. And, and as we said, um, a lot of companies, and we've seen that in a couple of the mergers today, uh, buy a company and they kind of leave it whole and it becomes an operating unit. And if you go back to the old McDonnell Douglas, McDonnell Douglas. And McDonald was in St. Louis. Douglas was in California. And in the time I spent there, you know, they, they like never really integrated. And so we made the decision that on day one, we were going to, you know, kind of like put everybody in a box and shake it up and then reorganize and then put the best people in the jobs that were available, regardless of whether you were Heritage Lighthouse or Heritage Lockheed. And not only did we say it, Right, but we actually did it, and and I think that got us a lot of credibility. And you know, today, if you look at our leadership team, it is very much a blend of the of the of the two companies. And I think, you know, everybody looks for the tone at the top, and do your feet follow your rhetoric? And I think in this case, it did. And then I I, I also believe that the folks at IS and GS, you know, felt that we would be a better container a better capital structure, a better business development and execution processes, which would help them to grow and, right. and uh, to advance in their career. And so I think it, it worked out well. Yeah, I, I think it's been a model for successful acquisitions. And the reason I say that is, and, and maybe you had an advantage not being, say, like a career, you know, SEIC person or something like that for 30 years. But uh, it's, seen, it's from the outside, it strikes me that people have taken on the combined personality of the combined companies much more quickly than, you'll still find people refer to themselves, oh, you work for another Grumman? They'll say, no, I'm a Grumman person. And they'll still say that even though this is a 25 year old fact of their heritage. But I, I haven't well, really seen that in but, your act. But you know, we actually, we celebrate our heritage, right? right? So we're, we are 50 years old as a company. And uh, we, talk, we talk about Bob Beister almost every day. Right, yeah. Because Bob, who was our founder and, and we were, a, an ESOP or employee owned for the first 40 years. And that allowed him to create a really kind of entrepreneurial innovation culture. And, and we think that's a competitive advantage. And you know, we, we don't want to be, quote, you know, kind of corporate. Right. We want to be kind of the fun, exciting, take risk, uh, move fast, fail fast um, culture that Bob created. Um, and, you know, Bob wrote a book and you know, he said, you know, none of us are as smart as, as all of us. And really by empowering and pushing down responsibility and decision making, we unlock the talent of our people. And that has proved to be a terrific model for us. Yeah. And, and does this push to scale? You know, I mean, and it's happening across the industry. Is, is, is that simply a good balance sheet move for investment? Or does it help you do the jobs better? Because at most, you get to a billion dollars, you can pretty much be a prime on almost any piece of work. I'll say outside yeah. of really complex multi-year aerospace right. engineering projects, you can pretty much do the job as, as a billion dollar prime. What does being a $10 billion prime give you an advantage of and just getting work done for your government customers. Yeah, well, we kind of great? look at it in four areas. And I talked about you know, technology, innovation, uh, research and development. And by the way, that's both you know, CAS and non-CAS, because right. we spend a significant amount of, of money in R&D that's not recoverable because of our commercial right. operations. Um, and that we have a set of technical core competencies that underpin the work that we go after and that we can adequately fund those technical core competencies and then the underpinning capabilities like AIML and data analytics and, and things like that. Um, the, the second is the breadth that it gives us across our government customer base. Mm. And so we have a terrifically diverse portfolio, which means we are not overly weighted in any particular contract or any particular customer. And that gives us some resiliency that you could be a billion dollar customer, 
or a billion dollar company, but you might be overly dependent right, on right, one right. customer. And then if you lose, you know, a large contract, uh, then you know, that, that could you know, create pressure on your income statement and your balance sheet. And we love uh, the size and diversity. Uh, kind of a third area, really, really important to us is, uh, is the people. Um, in one day, we added 15,000 really qualified, highly motivated uh, industry veterans to our company. People who had been working with customers for 20 and 30 years, had been executing on contracts, uh, just a terrific group of people. And, and we didn't quite double in size from the people, but almost, uh, and unlike like my prior company, Boeing or McDonnell Douglas, we are very much a people company. Right. And we generate our smart ideas, we create our mission support through the creativity of our people. And to get 15,000 people, you know, a third of them with lifestyle polys um, in one day uh, was, was really amazing. And then the fourth area, and we don't really talk about it much, um, and John, you understand this, you may have the capability to bid, but if you don't have the past performance call, sure. then you might be able to do the work, but you, you may not even get an invitation to bid or tender, or you may not pass the past performance part of Schedule M because you don't have the requisite reference contracts. And when, when we were able to bring in the IS and GS business, you know, we ended up with a, a whole new set of IDIQ vehicles, but past performance quals in a lot of areas right. that we as a SEIC Lidos uh, didn't have. And so it really expanded our addressable market, almost doubled our addressable market o overnight, and, and, and scale really helped with that. Yeah. You, you mentioned your commercial business too. This has been interesting, you know, being an industry participant and watcher since, since the late 80s. It's been interesting to me. I remember Ernst Volgino, the founder of SRA, stood us up in a theater in 1994 it said the Cold War's over, we won it, um, now I want that, that peace dividend, now I want our biggest customer to be the Postal Service or Wall Street <laughs> or something. Um, Boeing took a shot at making buses in there somewhere during the peace dividend. I think Northrop was in, had canoes right. in some place. I mean, it was really interesting. Everybody was, Lockheed had a big um, parking meter business. They eventually sold back to ACS. I mean, yeah. every, yeah. all the aerospace companies were casting about for what to do during the peace dividend. And then, of course, you know, after 9-11, everybody was back in the defense business. But um, not many people have been successful in the GovCon business is having a commercial business yeah. and a government business because they're just two different animals from top to bottom all the way down. You've, you've got a pretty healthy foot in both camps right now with Lidos. So how are you pulling it off? What's working or not working in that? And, and, and then where are you thinking of, of going with that mixture? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of lessons that you know, those of us who have been doing this for a while have learned. I actually was at the Boeing plant where we built BART, the cars right. from the Bay Area Rapid right. Transit, right. Um, not very successfully. Um, and uh, we have to be careful, by the way, I think we always have to be careful at the top of a cycle because we, um, we always think the grass is greener on the other mm -hmm. side of the fence, and we, we convince ourselves something is an adjacency when it's really not. Um, the commercial businesses that we have in Lidos, in many ways, have the same characteristics of the businesses that we go after in, if you will, GovCon space. So we look for uh, highly regulated, very complicated acquisition processes. Uh, very, very sophistic sophisticated customers who differentiate based not on like price, like LPTA, but differentiate on innovation. Um, and where, again, our past performance quals, our technical core competencies, the things that we think make us different as a company give us some kind of a differentiated advantage mm -hmm. uh, in that world. So, I mean, healthcare is the one we, we talk about, about most, although commercial energy is another great business for us. So, you know, healthcare, as we all know, because we're in the system, more regulated every day. We now have the exchange, uh, you know, CMS is setting pricing, and it is, a, it is a complicated RFP process. And the commercial healthcare providers are struggling 
with the same issues that VA is and that DHA is. So it, it makes sense to go after it on its surface, but what you need to understand is what I would call the service and delivery, what we actually do is similar, but the acquisition process, although sort of RFP tender driven, is very different. Mm. And if, if you look at a commercial hospital and say, I can treat that like a VA or a DHA contract, uh, then you'll fail. And where we have sort of built a different uh, configuration for the business is really in the front end business acquisition process. On the back end, service and delivery, you know, how you write code, you know, how you do agile development. You know, what we do in secure DevOps, we do in, in uh, agile development for our commercial customers. In fact, our largest software development facility, we do work for all four of our operating units in the same physical okay. space, right? Because the, the value stream and the processes that we use to do software development today are common. The business development side has to be very, very different. By the way, and the rules are different, okay. is uh, if I have an investor-owned um, healthcare system, I can go out to dinner with them and I can pick up the check, right? right, right? right. And I obviously I do not and cannot do that uh, with most of the government customers. You have a really cheap dinner. Yeah, 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 yeah per yeah, diem. Yeah, yeah, right. You can go to Chipotle. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let them pick up the check. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, you know, we heard, like, we, we had a dinner last night for, um, for some of the speakers just to uh, get some soundings of what's going on and we, what uh, polish up we want to talk about today. Several of the, the government officials mentioned that um, uh, and reaffirm something we all know, which is that most of today's acquisition system was designed to procure large aerospace systems and components and, right. and the various things thereof. And of course, now over, well over 50% of government contracting is services related, and, and most of it technology services related in many respects. Your own career seems to have parallel this. You're an aerospace <laughs> engineer, which is probably really useful for doing aerospace engineering stuff. Um, but now you're running a technology innovation services provider, systems integrator. Um, so h how do you think through that? I mean, you're a Six Sigma and a you know, former manufacturing guy and an aerospace engineer, but now you're in a very different business and yet you're still having to work most of your business through an acquisition process that reflects your old world, not so much your new world, but are these coming together in what way? How do you see that from, from the CEO's seat? Yeah, it's been an interesting uh, career and a transition and um, I worked on McDonnell Douglas's Joint Strike Fighter program in 93-94. F-35 went IOC last year. Right. Okay, yeah. that's a long <laughs> time constant. All right, uh, I had the Apache program, as you probably know. Yeah. That's a 40, 50, 60 year franchise, yeah. and you only have to win it once. Uh, in our world, you know, we talk about book to bill. We didn't talk about book to bill in my other life. We have to win a billion and a half every month, mm. and it's every month. I mean, it's the time constants are shorter. Um, we have to be more agile, um, and we are trying to do this in a system, right, that really was created to buy F-35s and Apaches. And I think we all struggle with the system that we have, the PBBS acquisition system, and the need to move fast. I know Ellen will be here later today, and if you talk to Mike Griffin, he will say the same thing, is that we have got to overhaul and find ways to use the system that we, we have inherited to respond to the need and, and by the way, the threat, right? Because the, the people that we are building systems to counter don't even have a PBBS system, right? They're, you know, uh, centrally managed. They can make decisions in a day, you know, for us to get an ECP processed and what have you. So there have been some bright, uh, um, uh, bright lights on the horizon. Uh, we're back. You know, I, I had at one time the largest OTA. It was an 845, Section 845 OTA, but it was a $20 billion OTA. Um, and you know, we could argue whether it went all that well or not, but as a result, OTAs were sort of outlawed for a decade, and nobody wrote 845s. Uh, and now, 
we're yeah, using 804s yeah, right. right to to be agile and to be flexible and to move much faster that's a good start mm -hmm. um, um, again I, I i think there have been events in our acquisition history which have driven more bureaucracy and oversight into our process and by the way i think separated the contractor team from the customer team to where you know i grew up in my early years i would go out on flight test i'd be with my customer right. in the room on a joint testing and got to understand their mission. Uh, I created relationships that were career long relationships and the whole system has gotten away from that and we've gotten too focused on the compliance and, and you know, checking every box as opposed to realizing, hey, we're here for a purpose and that's to help you know, the administration protect the country against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that ought to be overriding. And we need to continue to improve our acquisition system so it can be responsive to the threat that we have to fight in the future, and one that's not constrained um, by the systems that we have. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, I often look for in conversations with my own government partners, I often look for even simple things like how often we actually talk about each other like, as a partner or a vendor. Right. That's, I mean, even those words make a big difference because they, uh, they betray in some ways the, you know, where you sit in somebody's uh, value chain. And uh, for the kind of work your company does, mine and some others, it, it's like an agile software development team, right? Constant partnership, constant interaction, constant flexing. Um, do you, and this swings on a pendulum over the course of time. It, sometimes there's good partnerships, they say industry and the government are too cozy and let's have uh, more separation, and then, and then sometimes we get into it, we're too far separated, and actually a vendor-supplier relationship is not the best way to categorize complex service contracting. Where are we now, in, in, in your mind, in that swing about the, the general relationship of government contracting, um, especially services, with their customers? Well, I, I like to think that we are swinging more in the collaborative direction, mm -hmm. um, but the, the movement of change in the system that we've created is, is just way too slow. And, uh, and we do measure uh, this relationship almost by administrations, by, because the administrations pick the secretaries, the secretaries um, you know, kind of drive the culture in, in the building, at least in the Pentagon, and we could talk about the other government mm -hmm. agencies as well. And now we're in the maybe last year and a half you know, before an election, and uh, you know, trying to get change done, trying to get anything done in the last year before an election is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. So I, I especially I, in a CR environment. On it's, the, on it's the a CR environment. Yeah. I mean, clearly there are things in the newspaper that are getting more attention than you know, buying services and equipment for the nation, and and I think that's unfortunate uh, because we ought to be looking at what are the emerging, you know, now near peer. Uh, nations and there are clearly countries out there who said we want to be the military and economic leader of the world mm. um, and we have a 50 year, 100 year, 1000 year plan to do that and we need to focus on our response to that instead of whatever we may be focusing on whatever's in the Washington Post today which unfortunately probably isn't about mm. um, uh, making sure that we are the strong nation that, that we need to be. Um, I, I, I believe that the acquisition professionals on the government side, you know, understand this and they want to do the right thing, and, and, but they look at their leadership and where we are in the political cycle and, you know, what can you do with kind of a year left? And, you know, you'll have, uh, I think Bruce is coming, mm -hmm. and you'll have Ellen, and you say, okay, what can you get done with the time you have left. Now, maybe they have five years instead of one, uh, but I know I've talked to many of them, and they go, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna go for that thing that takes three years to implement. I'm gonna pick a project that I can, I know I can get done or at least get started because if the administration changes and you have gone through, say, you know, quote, the equivalent of milestone B, then you're a candidate for rescission. Right, and right. so um, I, I'd like to think we're going in the right direction. I am a little concerned what the future looks like two or three years out. Assuming we keep the two-year budget deal, we get through a CR, we finally get to a bill, um, then 
hopefully we, we keep that for two years, then you let some of those obligations flow through. You maybe you've got two and a half, three years, and then after that, we are running a trillion dollar deficit. And there, there are some dark clouds on the horizon relative to our whole acquisition system, and we cannot borrow a trillion dollars a year forever. And that is gonna come home to roost you know, three or four years from now, and I think you know, all of us in the industry are trying to understand what that means. It, if I was probably clear what it means, it means lower revenue and higher taxes, mm. right? Because I don't know how else you deal with the deficit. Mm. And so we're all, we're all giving that some thought, but relative to the acquisition- Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, right. the well, play was great. Well, and, and yeah, yeah. you know, Kai Von Rumor, who's at Cowan, yeah, sure, know. you know, put out a, a piece yesterday that said, you know, have multiples topped, yeah. you know, in, in the industry. And he, he points to these issues by whether these are not, uh, this is not new news, um, but it is something we're all thinking about. Yeah. Um, and well, it does seem to be, because Kai covered me when I was public, I remember, it does seem to be a perennial thing. We always say multiples are the highest they'll ever be, and then the industry keeps getting more and more value. But, but I understand the, the right. dynamics you're outlining. They can't yeah. go on forever. Right. Yeah. Um, let me ask you as a going out, question here, and if you did send in a question, um, I, I wouldn't know how to access it, so uh, on, on, on the iPad, so. Uh, here, let me so, help you. Yeah, 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 exactly, the technology CEO. So, so, um, so um, uh, if you have a burning one, I, I would say we're gonna have a long, vigorous, and very rich set of discussions today, say that. But let me ask you, um, Roger, because you know, I'm, I'm interested in the leadership aspect of life here. For many years, GovCon CEOs did didn't range outside of their remit, so to speak. You know, they, for the most part, they kept a low profile. If they were iconic like a Beister, it was within a very small community. Right. There are no Lee Iacocas, there are no, um, you know, Steve Jobses or all the rest. Um, and they rarely even got involved outside of their industry. Um, I mean, I ran into Josh Bolton, uh, uh, um, old friend sure. I worked in the Bush sure. White House with him who's now the president of the Business Roundtable, when you were right. part of this group yep. of CEOs from across the nation um, who put out a very bold statement, kind of redefining, for the first time in about 30 years, what's the purpose of a corporation? And, and weaved in themes of social responsibility and community leadership and a kind of whole of a good, what's the nature of a good society and what's the role of a corporation within that thing? This is not normal stuff for GovCon CEOs. So, so what were you thinking? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, why did you feel it was important to get out there with this group of, uh, of major Fortune right. 50 CEOs and just talk about the role of a corporation in a good society? Right, well, what, what let me, that? just so everyone understands what we did, there's a, a group called Business Roundtable led by Josh. Uh, Jamie Dimon was, the, was our chairman and uh, we have, there's a social responsibility group there we break into uh, areas of practice and we, we talked about um, how we run our companies. I mean, and you know, Delaware law, which we're a Delaware corporation right. says you have to optimize the company on behalf of the shareholders. And, and we said, well, we do that, but we really run the company for a broader set of stakeholders and we really do every day. Our employees, our customers, the communities in which we operate, our supplier partners, uh, and our shareholders, right? And uh, we take a lot of flack in the press for being single-minded. And we as a group of leaders said, but we are not single-minded. We care about our people. We care about the communities in which we operate. I mean, you know, I'm in my community, people know me. Uh, they want to know that I'm a good neighbor and I'm a good citizen. I'm giving back in the community, right? And they think, and I think, that with these positions comes a responsibility. And um, the BRT last made a statement in 1997 about the purpose of the corporation. And you know, if, if you look at what J.P. Morgan has done with Detroit, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but they have put a lot of their own money into rebuilding the inner city in Detroit and they don't get a lot of credit for it. Um, and so we said, we want to make a statement that we're running these corporations for a much broader purpose. Um, and but we did have the discussion about, okay, is that consistent with Delaware law? And we have a 
we have quite a few lawyers at the BRT, and we kind of came back and said, we think running a corporation for a broad set of stakeholders is good for business mm -hmm. and is very much complementary to our responsibility to generate value for our shareholders. In fact, there's a lot of statistics that says uh, companies uh, with a social conscious companies that give back to the communities, companies that have a diverse workforce, there are all of these, you know, what we call ESG indexes, and the, the companies with a social conscience actually outperform those right, that don't. Right. And financially outperform. Financially yes. outperform, right, from a total shareholder return. Yep. And so we said, we're all doing this. It makes tremendous sense. It's who we really are from our values. Uh, what's wrong with actually standing up and, and saying it? And then we made it optional whether the CEOs signed mm -hmm. the new statement of corporate purpose. And at Lidos, we were thrilled. We were, we were, we were one of the early uh, signatures uh, to the corporate purpose. Um, you, also, you, you also mentioned about, um, I, I use your words, you know, like iconic leadership, and, and um, Bob Beister was an yeah. iconic leader. Right. Okay. I mean, he, he took the risk, he founded the company, you know, he put his house up uh, uh, as collateral for the right. loan that started SAI, um, and you know, my role here, I'm a custodian of this corporation, right? I, I will be here for you know seven years or eight years or whatever it will turn out to be, and then I will hand the reins over to the next you're CEO. Boy, you're, you're a national spokes leader of your own volition about the opioid crisis. Absolutely. I mean, what's, what's driving, you've got a lot to do during the day. You've got a busy day. What's driving going beyond just being a good custodian and caretaker of shareholders, employees, and customers at, at, at Lidos? Um, uh, maybe I had good parents, you know. <laughs> I, um, it's, it's the way I was raised. It's what I was taught. It's the responsibility that comes with leadership. Um, we still have this feel of employee ownership at, uh, at Lidos. And you know, all of the, and you were a big supporter of Heartwalk, and, mm -hmm. and uh, these, all of the places where we give back have sort of started grassroots. And, and you know, my view is to connect our organization with their future. And, and uh, you know, some of my best days are when I'm out with the team and the people. And you know, I, I get to hear some of the terrific things we're doing for customers, for them, the, the changes we make in their lives. And I, let's say, I don't think you can do these jobs and not deeply care for the people that you work with. Mm -hmm. and, Maybe there are other companies, maybe there are places that do that, but uh, we still have that deep culture of employee ownership. And uh, I like to say I have 34,000 bosses, right? And, and I will also tell you that if I, if I step out of line, they email yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Or they come into my know, office. They'll let you know. And, and they will say, this is my company, yeah. and why don't you do something about this? The issue with opioids, um, started with an email from an employee who had lost his son. And I get emails from employees every day. And it was, we used to, Roger, you say we're a healthcare company. What are we doing about right. the opioid crisis? And, and this was like three years ago. And you know, I've been blessed. My, my family has not really experienced this, although we have certainly been over-prescribed Oxycontin, uh, I think, as everybody in America has by the statistics. and we started investigating and we went, I can't believe 75,000 people a year die of opioid overdose that usually starts with a prescription mm. uh, as opposed to you know, like recreational, right. uh, which is sort of the mindset, which is why there's this whole negative stigma on opioid addiction. And um, we just, we looked at it and said this, more people in one year die from opioid abuse than died in the Vietnam War from beginning to end. Yeah. And we weren't, nobody was talking about it. And we just thought, we're a healthcare company, this is huge. And the concern was, if I have one employee who had a problem, I probably have hundreds of employees right. Right. who have problems. And, and I talk about it a lot. If I do a town hall, I usually end it with a discussion on opioids. And as I leave the room, there's always an employee or two waiting for me at the door. And you can just, you can look and you, you, you just know what their story is going to be. And so we found it's, it's hundreds of employees. 
a child, a brother, you know, a, a neighbor who has uh, started with surgery, you know, Oxycontin, you know, they're on it for 10 days, they're on it for 20 days, and then before you know it, they can't get off of it. And it just, it just really, it touched me. And I said, we have the power in the company uh, to make a difference. Uh, one other point I do want to make is that we have made a commitment. We give 1% of earnings back. You know, so it's just a, it's what we have said. And we do not have, like the Lidos Community Fund, you know, other companies where you, you, know, you ask people to contribute, you pool it, and then you spend the money. Uh, what we do is we make a commitment to spend, and we have essentially told our employees, we want to know where you invest your time, talent, and treasure. And then we will follow that with our corporate commitment. And again, it's, it's just the feel of the company that we are. It really starts with our employees and for us to understand what's important to them and therefore it becomes important to us as a corporation. Yeah, no, I think it's real harbinger of the way things are coming and, and frankly the millennial generation employees demand it. They, they mm -hmm. demand this out of their em employer. Um, well, great. Well, you know, for, for many, many years in this industry, the CEO got to be the CEO by being a, basically an Uber program manager in many ways. That's how you came up through the okay. ranks, right? You ran a program well, clipboard, bullhorn, stopwatch, stuff happened on time, on budget, on schedule and everything. Uh, and as the industry has grown, people have observed it takes a different, an additional set of qualities to, to lead an organization effectively. And I want to ask you to join me in thanking Roger Crone for showing us what those qualities are in, in leading uh, one of the biggest and leading GovCon companies in the space. So thank you, Roger. Thank you Great, very thanks, much. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.